Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to the world's best-selling author of drawing and cartooning books, Christopher Hart. His latest is manga for the beginner, Midnight Monsters. And this is his second time as a guest on the show. Stick around, but beware the vacant, almond-shaped eyes, and especially the bat wings. They're a dead giveaway. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of zombies, vampires, and Sailor Moon, and the teen girls who love them in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I was in London over the summer, mixing business with pleasure, take note IRS, when my family and I dropped into the Tate Modern Museum. It's a spectacular venue full of masterpieces that anyone would agree deserve a place on display, and more than a few we could all probably disagree to agree to disagree on. At the end of our self-guided tour, we spent a good hour in the museum gift shop, where I stumbled upon an impressive display of cartooning books by a previous Mr. Media guest. Christopher Hart. Now, I figured that he probably already knew his books were being sold there, but I know from personal experience that every author enjoys photographic proof that his books are well displayed. So I snapped a shot of the Hart books and posted it on Facebook. By the time we returned to our hotel that evening, Chris Hart had already responded with thanks and told me that, he, what a surprise, he had a new book due in a couple of weeks. Which brings us to today's show. Now, the first time Christopher Hart was here, it was to promote Humongous Book of Cartooning, which was exactly that. Today, he's going to talk about his latest, Manga for the Beginner, Midnight Monsters. Even better, he's going to do a little technique demonstration to show you exactly how to do it. Chris Hart, welcome back to Mr. Media. Thanks very much, Bob. I really appreciate being here. I had fun last time, and uh, we had a new book, and so it's it's time to talk to uh, the artists again, <laughs> the aspiring manga artists and cartoonists and everyone out there. And it's great to have you here, and uh, of course, uh, a little belatedly, greetings from London. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. You know, right after you took that picture, the curator got fired. No, no, I'm just joking. Oh, okay. you, oh you got me there. I thought, <laughs> I thought wow. <laughs> No, that's that's really a kick. I couldn't believe it. I was in a you know a gift shop, a museum. Um, but that's a uh, you know at least it gives kids who are bored to tears something to do when they're looking at classical paintings. You know, look at this vampire. Quiet, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my question actually. I I I had to I had to ask. D did you know that the books were in that particular museum, or do you know that they're in museums in general, or until somebody gives you that kind of evidence, do you not, no, just I, not know? No, I don't know. You know, I know that they're they're distributed to uh, special sales, which are um, gift shops, things like that, but I have no idea uh, where, what gift shops. I know when it comes to bookstores or big art supply chains, art and crafts chain stores, uh, but it's such a kick to find something like this, or online sometimes I'll see that... Uh, some uh, co college course has required reading, you know, Heroes and Villains by Christopher Hart. So we can look at the myth and establish that, you know, whatever they're doing, it's fine with me. It's, I get a real kick out of it. Yeah. 
Well, that's good. See, I just assumed that you, 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 that was not going to be news to you. So that's nice to hear that you did not know I it was there. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be more... I'm going to be more on, uh, more into it now. I'm going to take more pictures of more authors' books who have been on the show. Of course, that might eat up my whole vacation next time. So never yeah. mind. I'm not doing it. But then you can deduct everything. Well, the whole that, thing, right? Might be something to that. So, Chris, when did you know that you had kind of gone from this guy who was doing cartooning and drawing books to being kind of the guy who does cartooning and drawing books? When did you know? When did you kind of make that leap? Well, th uh, thanks. Uh, I want to say that although my books are, are you know, very, very popular, thank goodness, uh, there are there are other guys who do, you know, drawing books do very good jobs of that. Also, you know, it's all what works for you. But luckily for me, a lot of people uh, like how I do it, how I explain it, um, how I do the steps, and uh, and the humor that's involved in, in my style of writing for for the books. Um, what happened was, I think, you know, my book started out uh, doing very well for my publisher. And there was a little surprise. They'd never done cartooning books before. Um, and if you, when I started, if you looked at the bookshelf in the art instruction area, you might see one book on cartooning and 85 on how to paint a bowl of fruit. And so it was, uh, I knew we were disappointing children somewhere. <laughs> but also, what, what I think the book shows didn't realize at that time is that teenagers and adults also had an interest in cartooning, manga, fantasy art comics, I mean, the average comic book reader is 30 years old. I mean, they, we, they had a, you know, didn't have a quite view of who their audience was. So I thought it was a good opportunity to uh, expand this into different areas because it's not just cartoons. Like I said, it's manga, superheroes, or all these different avenues. I did a book called, uh, early on, called Heroes and Villains, drawing comic book heroes and villains. And it sold over 100,000 copies, and it was like, this is great. So they, I kind of got in the map that way. And then um, I was the first American author, I think, to do um, a book on how to draw manga. And that really exploded. And I had a whole series, Manga Mania, and then Manga for the Beginner Now, which is the one I'm, I'm working on, um, which came about because of that. And it's really that you have a few series back to back. And you, the kids and the grown ups and the teenagers, they start to notice. And I also, I, I go back and forth with the. Um, my readers and um, people who have never read my books but are interested in this kind of genre uh, from my Facebook or our website, I, you know, we, we dialogue back and forth a lot. And so um, I think there's a, a personal quality to what, we, what they do with me, what I do with them. And so when they read my books, uh, they kinda, it's kind of like opening a book and reading what a friend has written to you. you know? So I think that helps, uh, that, that has is, is put me in a nice place with my readers. Is there a, is there, a general there, format that you follow in terms of, you know, we start with A, we go to B and C and on down the line, or does it vary from book to book? I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I've, I've seen humongous book. I think I saw the heroes and villains book. I've, <laughs> I've read through this uh, uh, Midnight Monsters book. Um, it seems like there's a, there's a, a bit of a format established. How would you explain it though? Well, you can't really reinvent uh, certain basics. They have to go from book to book. You know, uh, you need a head shape. You need certain guidelines to, to hang the head, uh, features on the head. You know, the body has to have a certain framework. But within those steps, there are differences in style, uh, a lot of difference in style. Um, a, a funny cartoon guy, cartoony retro cartoon guy, like a, a kind of, you see on like Fairly Odd Parents, um, or a girl, like a student, uh, and Fairly Odd Parents would be wacky funny, quite different from the student, like, as you were mentioning, Sailor Moon. <laughs> I mean, they're totally different, but we still have to use certain step-by-steps to get there. What I also like to do is, in addition to the basics, every book has to have certain basics. Now, I like to cover them so they're not boring, like basics, boring. But I like to do something where, you know, even the simplest drawing has a personality. Mm -hmm. So you'll want to draw it, you know. But... Also, I like to cover areas and aspects of, of cartooning and drawing and, and creating these images that aren't in every art book uh, and are important. For instance, in, in Midnight, uh, Manga for the Beginner, Midnight Monsters, which is all about the kind of twilighty, you know, angst-ridden vampires and gothic girls, etc. One thing that's very important that's rarely mentioned in how to draw books is color because these are very colorful characters, but all cool colors on the color spectrum, and no hot colors because they're um, undead. <laughs> they are undead. There's no corporeal life. There's no like nice pink fleshy tone to them or bright eyes. You know, so uh, 
there's a certain palette that you need. And well, I can even show you. I'm, um, okay. I, I happen to have this book here. How convenient! I know it would shock you, um, but let me see if I can turn to. Yeah, for instance, this is a picture, uh, a way to do it, almost a blue wash look. There is that. That's perfect. perfect. That's a good height. And as you can see, it has a uh, has a lot of color, but they're very close in hue to each other. It's a way to do this without having a lot of contrasting colors. So it has a soupy sort of atmospheric look. And we go into many different styles uh, of color and also um, layout, uh, which is another area that's not always uh, shown specific to uh, a type of, a type of um, genre. Like this, for instance. Uh, for, let me see. Yeah. Like this house. I got this like uh, you think. No, you look at it and you say that's kind of spooky. It's kind of like it's the rooftop of a house, so right. bats and this. And what makes it spooky? Well, the thing that first makes it spooky, the basic thing is, it's tilted. Ah. It's not what it is. It's not what the. It's not the stuff around it. It's it's tilted. Um, so there are certain fundamental things that give you a real key. You know, when you have a, a, a canted frame, that means basically your stuff is tilted. It immediately tells the audience. Something wrong is going on here. You have no stability in the scene. What about if, off, what about if the host is tilted? What does that say? I think you need a chiropractic adjustment, but you're fine. All right. You're not uh, scaring me, Bob. All right, all right. Um, how different is uh, the manga from, uh, you know, what Western, uh, Western uh, cartoon styles? Is, is it that different? Is it mostly just... In the eyes and the, the you know the, we, I, I kid about the, the and you mentioned the uh, the, the, the almond shaped eyes is uh -huh. it that or is it is it something more profound? No, it's uh it, it's it's quite different actually, uh, and not always almond shaped. In certain genres they are, but they're so stratified. The genres in manga, uh, there's a genre called uh, shoujo and chibi, which are very cute and uh, and younger, and the eyes are gigantic and very very vertical, mm -hmm. um, whereas in the vampire sort of gothic genre, um, which includes a lot of bishoujo, bishonen type characters, which are kind of the uh, handsome older teen characters or pretty older teen characters, then those eyes are more um, and So they're very, you have to learn the very uh, specific genres. They don't always overlap. But in addition, the basic head shapes and basic features are different also, hmm. you know, and I come from an animation and cartoon background, so it was tough for me at first to blend some of these together because the instinct was to go to these very solid, you know, ra very round, um, you know, faces. And the manga faces, the, the construction for those is quite different with a, usually a very, very tapered chin, not a lot of cheeks on either side, the, you know, uh, big eyes taking up most of the forehead and the features being very small, very subtle, not even showing lips sometimes, just a line for lips. There's a subtlety to it, so you have to really be, be immersed, I think, in, in all the genres to start to see the different flavors. I mean, drawing is drawing. Foundations are foundations. Uh, but, this, but, but one thing that is underestimated, I think, a lot in, in drawing, especially by, you know, art, art teachers and instructors in art colleges, is that, is that they, they would always say that you know, don't worry about style. You can learn that yourself. We'll teach you the fundamentals. Well, I'd like to see that guy do a manga face <laughs> without style. I'd like to see him do a, a retro cartoon and not worry about style. Style is art. And if you ask the aspiring artists who you see at different social networks for, for, for artists, and you can see their work there. There's so many talented kids out there, so many talented teens, and lots of adults who are also drawing this stuff. Um, some who never, who always wanted to draw, and now they're at a point where they have a little time they can do it. Uh, I mean, you'll see that they know style is very important. You can't get a mood or a feeling from a character just because you drew an accurate pose. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I could I could take the same character, um, put that character in two different costumes. One maybe uh, a very a very a woman, very chic, sort of uh, carefree, uh, you know, retro '60s look walking down the street and have somebody else uh, walking down the street, sort of a gothic, uh, introverted costume, and you'll get two completely different feelings from it, but the pose could be the same. Hmm. So uh, the style is really, really important. Um, so that's something that's, that's taught also in my books. I, I'd love to, I'd as you were saying, saying that, I'd love to see 
car- standard cartooning so- style. I, I say standard. That's not fair. But uh, let, for the sake of argument, let me use that as the term. Standard cartooning style, side by side with manga in like a story. So you know, like you're seeing. <laughs> so you're seeing, you know, like Henry, the old character Henry. I'm just thinking of the <laughs> right. bald head. You know, side by side with like Sailor Moon, and you you know you maintain that. It'd be kind of interesting. Um, that, that would be interesting. You'd have to wonder which world would they go into. Are they is the Sailor Moon in, in the cartoon world, or the cartoon world, the cartoon character in the Sailor Moon world? I, I like that idea. Yeah, well, if you can get a book out of it, I'll just take my usual percentage. Um, it seems to me that the the manga characters are consistently more detailed. They have more detail in their faces, in their bodies, in their clothes than, again, the Western cartooning. Is that an overstatement, or is that on track? No, I think for the hand-drawn stuff, I think you're really on track. Even for some of the CGI stuff, the computer-generated imaging, the animated movies that you see that are done on computer, I I think you're right. Um, One reason is, very simple reason, the line work is a lot thinner, more delicate with the manga stuff. And so the very thick line, some of these retro things and uh, and wacky, you know, TV shows, animated TV shows, it, it makes it gives it more of a flat look, and they exaggerate that flatness. They bring it out in front. They almost make fun of the the flatness of the character rather than the old time Disney roundness of some of the characters, which I I also adore. I find that you know wonderful and inviting. But this, but you know, it's fun when you see something make a parody of something. You know, um, but I I think that there is uh, especially with I mean the the, the romanticism of the, the hair, the distraught characters. You know, manga is not so much about, uh, you know, uh, going over the hill to find the pot of gold. It's about, you know, the relationships up with, between the characters getting there. Um, they don't have to have super muscles like Superman. They don't have to be George of the Jungle. You know, they, they can, they can, they really, they talk uh, and have dramatic relationships together. So you'll see like, like I say, windblown hair or very introspective poses and, and the more you can do things that are semi-realistic, the more detail it takes. So it just serves the mood that they're that they're portraying. Well, mood is a good word. I'm thinking because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of angst and and uh, frustration, depression, gloom, uh, mm-hmm. and it seems to particularly appeal, I think, to to, to young men and women, teens, early twenties, because that's what they're going through. Their emotions are running rampant, and they <laughs> see that in the characters, and so. If you if you learn to draw in that style, that's part of what you've got to convey, right? It's a lot of emotion. Yeah. But what I like to do is take that sort of that uh, all those scoops of angst you pour on all those uh, those characters, and there and and not make it um, not make it gory. I don't like uh, I don't like a gothic and and horror genres that are gory. I like the genres that we have now, where you have like like we're talking about the angst ridden you know older teen who is looking for his identity. And instead of making him, uh, you know, a sorry character, he is an anti-hero. He's the guy who uh, he has some power, some danger to himself. He wants to be a loner. You just don't know which side he's going to fall on, good or bad, when the time comes. That's an interesting character. It used to be in the old days, you know, this was the good guy, this was the bad guy. Well, the guy in the middle, with a kind of gray outlook, is interesting. And also, it's all swept up in. Um, in, in romance and a tragic sort of romance, you know, you have to. I mean, a lot of these characters are. You know, you can't. If you love a vampire, it's not going to come out the right way. <laughs> you know, mom's not going to like them. Uh, that kiss is going to be really have a lot more impact than a kiss with a regular teenager. Um, so uh, it, it, the, the stories become big and, and interesting, and, and they spark lots of drama. So uh, instead of so we all have uh, as we as we're in the teenage years some sort of gloom and introspection, but we also have heroic impulses. You know, we want to see the world be better. We want to we want to accomplish something. We want to grow up and be this and be that. These are sort of role models in a way. That's yes, this is what they're going through, but they're also striving to overcome their difficulties. And and like superheroes uh, have like uh, mutants might have trouble handling the powers of the mutations. If you're if you are uh, you know a teenager and find out that you're a vampire, <laughs> you know that's something to deal with also, uh, and you have to struggle with your own identity and where do you belong? Do you belong? Do you want to belong where you belong? Or do you want to be with the humans? Do you, does love trans translate? You know, go pe- transfer back and forth between those two worlds. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff in in, uh, in these allegorical settings. Is is, is Spider Man still human or is he a mutant? Should he be with the <laughs> Avengers? Or should it be with the X-Men? Oh, no, Anyone who wants to be, fine with me, as long as he's on the screen. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, 
so tell me the different you the first uh, manga series you did was um, was called what the it was called manga mania okay and th- that you really jumped right in and now you've gone back and are doing manga for the beginners so what's the difference between the two sets of books so if i'm you know thinking yeah i'd like to get some books to show me how to do manga why would i get the beginner set or or the the, the, sure. the mania set manga mania is great for someone who says uh you know, I love this style. You know, I'm a fan of Sailor Moon, or I'm a fan of Naruto. Uh, I really like the boys' action stuff, So, which is called Shonen. That's the name of the genre. I'd love to get a book on that. Go to Manga Mania. It, it, that's your thing, you know. You like uh, the Sailor Moon, go to the uh, uh, Manga Mania Shoujo. That's your thing, you know. It, it, that's for you. But if you're a beginning artist, you can still like the same things. I like the action scenes. I like this. But I'm trying to find my way a little bit in this. Now, I'm not sure that I'll be this type of artist, but I like to, it looks like fun. You know, this gives you the confidence to go and, and do it, you know, because uh, some people have a lower frustration level. And so what I'm trying to do with these manga for the beginner books is say, look, don't worry about where you are. You're actually going to draw something nice. <laughs> it's going to look good because we're going to really start at the beginning and give you a lot of steps and hints. I do side hints all over the place in these books. Uh, and so you'll get to see the stuff you like. And then you'll see, uh, you know, we also do different genres in the manga for the beginner. Like this is Midnight Monsters. You know, I have manga for the beginner, Kawaii, which is all cute stuff. But they all start basic drawings so that you don't have to you don't have to feel that you're you have there's a certain requirement before you get to the book mm-hmm. I thought that was important because after I came up with manga mania there were a lot of uh, people who were trying to do the same sort of thing and they would try to slice it this way in manga how about we do manga spaceships we do manga this we do manga that and I, it hit me I said no one's doing one for beginners mm-hmm. <laughs> no one is doing one for people who just really want the basics uh, but even those people want certain genres. So we take the basics and we apply them to gothic stuff. We take the basics and apply them to cute stuff. And that's the manga for the beginner series. Now, how now, important, how important uh, you were talking yeah, a little while ago about uh, art teachers and the things that they would say. Uh, how important is uh, a, an understanding of anatomy in manga versus, uh, again, standard cartooning, as I say? And the reason I ask is, uh, gosh, it's been more than a decade now, but I, I, you know, I spent time with Will Eisner. Uh, and he... <laughs> He would. He did a lot of things with uh, students. He taught at the uh, School of Visual Arts in New York, and he he liked to go around to colleges and he would assess uh, portfolios. It's something he really liked to do. And inevitably, sure. what he told every single kid, no matter what their level was, he referred them to a particular book of anatomy, and mm-hmm. he'd say, you, "You you you've got a nice style, but you really need to get the essence of anatomy down." Is that as important in manga? I bet you what he was uh, what, what he was stressing was. You see the anatomy books, those reference books and other books on drawing anatomy so you can understand and supplement your understanding of life drawing and figure drawing. That's generally what uh, people like uh, the great Will Eisner and other, uh, you know, (laughs) which he is, and and other um, art teachers will tell you is that you need to be able to draw the figure. You need to know the correct proportions. They have to almost be instinctive. uh, Or you need to know... um, you know, how some of the musculature is. I mean, suppose that you have your arm out does, does uh, the latissimus dorsi, the back muscle, go in between uh, the, the bicep and tricep, or does it go wrap around the back? Sometimes it's not intuitive, and most of the time it isn't, but it is once you start to learn it. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very important. Style sometimes gets in the way a little bit because, uh, just like with fashion, uh, you'll have a character who is uh, nine heads tall when you do fashion drawings. Whereas the average person is seven and a half inches, uh, seven and a half um, heads tall, and that's the ratio. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. things change for style, you know. Um, that maybe like in a fashion drawing, the, the shoulder uh, shelf will be a little wider because it gives a little more drama. But the basics are are the same, you know. Uh, the, the ribs, the uh, the collarbone going out to the scapula, which is shul- shoulder bone. You learn interesting things, like you know, right here, this little bump you have in your shoulder. This is where your shoulder, uh, your scapula, your shoulder blade attaches to your collarbone. That's the only thing holding your shoulder blade in place is your collarbone. It's not attached to the spine or it wouldn't move. You learn these kind of things. So you, you see, so when you draw uh, someone from the back, 
you know, you can see how easily the, uh, the uh, shoulder blades move to define the back because they're kind of floating on the back muscles. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of things, but life drawing is something I do recommend. Uh, it's been very helpful to me. It's painful for the first semester or two if you really just want to draw manga, just want to draw cartoons. How in the world is this applicable? Right, right. Don't, even, don't even worry <laughs> about that. By the time you're in the second semester, at some point, I guarantee you, you, sorry, I guarantee you, you'll be sitting in front of your drawing going, oh, <laughs> I get it. So I don't know, I have to tell you why. Just go with the program. Mr. Eisner is correct. <laughs> Hard to argue. Hey, I've got something here if you want to see it. I, I thought I'd, I'd draw a little, uh, give a, a hint to your, um, your, your watchers, your, your listeners uh, for sort of the, the uh, macabre, romantic, gothic style of drawing. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Let's see what you got. So I, I, this morning I, I drew a, uh, a vampire sketch. Um, so let me see if I can get this around here. If you can see that. How's right, that? That's, that's good. That's good height. And if you look at the eyes, he looks kind of like he's uh, got a deer in the headlights look. You know, as if he's like a politician who's just been asked about his recent scandal. And what you want to do is you want to find a way to keep those delicate almond eyes and the delicate eyebrows, but make the eyes uh, a little more intense. So I'm going to try to do this from this position. I don't usually draw this way, but I want to show you a trick, which is, you see over here how clear the eyes are? Yep. yep. This uh, eyelid over here is actually like a cape. It, it's over the eye, and a light, which usually comes down from the ceiling of the sun, is blocked by this, and there's a little shadow under the eye. It comes across here. So we also bleed, use that shadow to bleed the um, pupil, into a, sh a shadow here as well and bring it around a little further and make that fairly intense a little shade in the bottom as it bumps up lighter shading here because again the eyebrow acts as a cape as a, as a rooftop to this and a little darker on top and a little bit of shading underneath here. So you can see on this side, he's got that intensity he needs. Right. Right. And this side, not so much. Hmm. So things like shading are, you know, shading is a, I mean, is a, there's a bit of a science to it, but also it's, it's a style based thing, you know, because we don't always do shadows based on just the logic of where the light source is. Sometimes sh shading reflects the mood of the character. There might not even be much of a light source, but all of a sudden you have a shot of him and he's in intense thought and, you know, everything in the shadow except the eyes where he's really thinking. So, you know, it's sometimes it's totally interpretive, not literal. So it, it is about style as well. So some of these kind of, you know, uh, they're not really tricks, they're just hints and techniques can enhance what you're already doing. You know, so many times aspiring artists, uh, especially the younger artists' work that I see on social networks, um, they have a lot, of, a lot of talent, a lot of ability, and it's not like they need a lot of help, a lot of change, but they, sometimes they just need to just go to uh, just be given a few pointers to get the most out of what they do rather than change what they do. Mm. That's, that's what's most exciting to me when I see somebody take something that, that they have and keep their natural style. You don't have to change it and make it mine or make it someone else's. Keep what you do, you know, but just bring out more life, more vitality, more personality uh, in that, uh, in that, from that drawing. And that's a real satisfying thing to do. Now the, now the sketch that you just showed us. Um, what would you do? And nice cup, by the way. What yeah, would you I think do? I can get a bigger cup somewhere. You know, you know. <laughs> if you can find a bigger cup, <laughs> buy it. Um, what would you do with that that same sketch in terms of color? Where where would you add color to him to c continue that theme of intensity that you're adding to the eye? It depends. Is he, is it a moment? And by that, um, you know, you talk. If you talk to directors, um, especially of commercials. Uh, their the commercial directors um, have to cut everything down to bits and instances. I mean, such small amounts, you know, half a second here for a shot, two seconds for a shot. They talk about finding the moment. And the moment is, uh, it's when everything basically freezes and you have a, a second where the audiences should feel something. And usually um, people think it's, it's at the point of some action. It's usually just after something has occurred. The reaction is where the audience gets the signal from the characters reacting to either laugh or cry or be worried or be, you know, astonished. 
So if, if this character were to uh, be in a real moment, a uh, dramatic moment, then I think a lot of the color would change in his background. So the background might be a blazing red as he's getting furious, or it could be like a bright, a light white and, and blue as it's uh, revealing something to him. But it's not always realistic. You know, I mean, it's fun when you have a, an unearthly character like a vampire to give him like, you know, uh, green hair with some shading, uh, could have white hair, uh, just the regular boy next door could do that, but it's, you know, you're the artist, you want to you know, push the envelope a little bit, sometimes that's an interesting way to go, and you need to know color combinations to do that, you know, what goes well with a lime green, so it won't stand out like crazy, so it looks like it's actually part of the picture. You you need a beard and glasses, uh, that's what you have to have. Right. That's, that's <laughs> actually, actually, the complement for that is orange. Orange and lime green go together very well. What about whorehouse red? Does that work? Does that work? Um, I think that's, that's that works. <laughs> that works. I think that that says it. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, okay. Chris, let me ask you. Um, when you did the uh, manga mania books, uh, when you started down the path there, did you get much much or any feedback from, um, let's say, oh I don't know, Japan, uh, indicating that uh, you know you're on the right track, sir, but uh, here's a couple elements that, that maybe are, are being lost from one culture to another, or, you know, is there any self-correcting that you had to do based on uh, feedback from the first series? Uh, yes. Uh, in, well, first of all, the interesting thing was not the feedback from Japan, but Japan's feedback was, um, when we were selling foreign rights, was, uh, no thanks, we do that here. Yeah. <laughs> and as we kept going, I would notice sometimes that some of the Japanese books would think, uh, oh, that's a good subject you covered. We'll cover that too, rather than, you know, I was, and I was kind of pleased by uh, having been, you know, um, you know given imitated. Them the spark or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, what happened though, later on they started to import some of our books. And what I believe happened is I tried to listen to, um, you know, the fans and the readers out there and the artists out there. And they're sophisticated in this. And they wanted more and more authenticity in, in the manga books. So as that was ratcheted up, uh, they became more acceptable as in Japan, where we now sell the books because it's looked on as authentic manga. That's very nice. And who have you and your publisher found consistently? You know, if you had to generalize, are, are the readers of these books? Are there are they are they people doing them for fun? Are they doing it for profit? Are they doing it for fun and profit? Are they, you know, have you had, uh, you know, have you heard of? Uh, uh, people who've moved on from these books to become professional artists? Who Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Very much so. Um, a lot. A great deal of people who draw manga love it. They love the, the art form. They love drawing it. And they would like to do this for their profession. They would like to go into art. So I, get, I get questions, which art school should I go to? How should I do this? How should I do that? Um, I just want to give one piece of advice for people looking to get into art school. Some art schools are, are difficult to get into. The RISDs, the art centers, you know, uh, Savannah School of Art and Design. Uh, I mean, um, I'll, there are wonderful art schools, but they're not, I shouldn't say that they are difficult because I don't know their exact requirements now. But it's not easy to get into a good art school. It's my basic thing. So you need a good portfolio. Mm. What happens usually is that you wait till you're about to apply, you find out what they want a portfolio, and you quickly give them what you, ha what you have and draw what you don't. But... If you're not, if they want, say, life drawing, as you mentioned, figure drawing, and you don't have any, and they say, we want to see some, and you spend a good month doing it, it's not going to look good, because you can't learn figure drawing in a month. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. So my opinion, uh, and my, my advice to people is, don't wait till you have to apply. Look at the schools that are interesting to you a year before you apply. Find out what subjects they want in your portfolio concentrate on those and get help from your art teacher on those. If they want to see some still life and you've never done that, great, you've got a year to work on that. If they want to see figure drawing, you've got a year to work on that. Then when you pre present your portfolio, you'll have some degree of ability in this area and the guy next to you has just put something together in two or three weeks. So you have a real advantage. So I, I like to give that as a you know, heads up to my, uh, my listeners. Hmm. Uh, just by coincidence, we're going through that in our house. We've got my uh, my teen is a senior and is oh. applying to art schools. And of course, you know that when you give advice to teens a year ahead of when they need it, they take it all the way, <laughs> and true. they plan ahead. They just plan so far ahead. <laughs> well, but if you give them the art supplies, 
you give them stuff that looks like a lot of fun to do. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, because remember, they actually like to do this. <laughs> Hey, what about Ringling School of Art and Design? Have you heard of that in, in it's a, Florida? It's a great school. We've been down there. We've done two tours down there. She's been to, to uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. We great. spent a week there over the summer. It's toured there. Yeah, we'll just see, you know, what we can afford and where where, where they'll take her. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure she'll, uh, that'll that'll work out well. So uh, as we're talking about that, the uh, last thing I wanted to touch on with you is uh, maybe for people who um, are, are new to you, uh, maybe you could explain a little bit about your own background. How did you begin uh, as an artist? Uh, what training did you have? Sure. Uh, well, I I drew ever since uh, I, I was really a little kid. But um, it wasn't until I was about 12 years old that I really started concentrating on cartoons. And then I watched every cartoon I could, and I, I convinced my parents I was studying cartoons. So I was basically just uh, you know, a 14-year-old watching cartoons all the time when most people were moving on to other things. I was... But I really was studying them. I, I joined uh, CIFA, which was the International Animation Organization. I would go to there uh, with a friend of mine, a buddy of mine, who also was a cartoon nut. We went to, we go to their, their, the special awards dinners, all these people, this banquet, and we're like 16. Everyone else is like, you know, 85. <laughs> it was kind of odd, but we were really obsessed about it. I, I tried to find out how I could improve, and I went to um, the Cartoonist Union when I was 16, uh, doing life drawing at night. That was one of the first lessons I took. And I got a job in... Uh, Animation at an animation studio in San Diego uh, when I was uh, in high school. I was a, a senior in high school, and so I used to drive on the weekends um, from L.A. to San Diego to and stay over at the producer's house one night, work on storyboards and character design, and come back. It was a great time in my life. I mean, it's like that was like, what I wanted to do, um, and I got accepted into the um, ca into the character design uh, character animation program at the California Institute of the Arts, and they had pros from Disney, directors, key animators, teaching and stuff, and they were wonderful. And, and the people were very talented. Uh, but we had to take so much animation before we got into the other parts. I didn't want to be an animator. I, want, I was looking to, be, to do more, put things together in a larger way, like books, you know, put a whole experience together. And I just, I found it too tedious. So I, I stopped there, I went to NYU. Uh, that was uh, film school. And I also still took some life drawing courses, did some work for, for freelance work for advertising agencies. And um, I worked for Mad Magazine while I was in school to uh, give me enough money to um, enjoy the city. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, make a long story uh, interesting. Um, what happened was I, I, I had two careers, basically. Uh, I had a film and TV career. I, I, I've written for um, uh, some network television shows and, and I worked for many of the studios with uh, scripts that were paid for. I paid to write them. They looked good. Great producers. Didn't get made. Story of Hollywood. I mean, a lot of writers just write for a long time, don't get things made. At the same time, when I, I was drawing my books, um, I, uh, I was asked to... Um, do another one and another one. Everything I was doing was getting made. It was something kind of nice about it. the effort was being rewarded. You know, uh, I mean, both you're making money, but one way you're you're actually seeing your work, and that's so nice. I'd rather have a script sitting in your, you know, your closet and wishing somebody else could see what you what you came up with. Um, I continued my uh, art education after that at a couple of art schools, um, and uh, that they had one lady at um, my first publisher um, who was a marketer. And when she came on, she looked at like, the four books I had done for them. And the first thing she said when she met me is, oh, hi, Chris. She said, you know, this is a series. I said, it is? She said, yes, it is. This is a series. I said, okay. <laughs> How does that work? And so she explained to me, you know, and, uh, and we, we had a 20-year association, um, Watson, Gupta, and I. Uh, and then they got, uh, I worked with another publisher, and they got purchased by Random House, and I've done some work for them there as well. So uh, it's I've been very fortunate. I really have, um, uh, but I, I'm very grateful because this is. Uh, I enjoy tremendously doing this, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to all the readers who who like my work enough to give me the opportunity to do this. That, that's why I try to answer personally every single email I get, my website or my Facebook. Mm -hmm. It takes me several hours a day to do this stuff, but um, and I can't get back to everybody, but I try mm -hmm. because. Uh, <laughs> I feel, feel I owe it. I want to do it because I, I, I'm rooting for everybody. You know, I know what it's like to be that kid wanting to be in this business, not knowing anyone in it in California mm -hmm. and trying to track people down. This is one thing I want to mention to you. You know, sometimes I get an appointment with an animation director and he wouldn't show up. 
I have me in my little tie and everything. I'm like 15 years old. My folks drop me off at the studio. We'll be back in two hours to pick you up. So I'm just standing there outside this locked studio. I, I remember this sort of stuff. They weren't always that nice. They were like very busy guys. Okay, but you know, I want to be accessible. I want to be so, so if you need a contact in this business, you don't know anyone, well, you can email me. I'll write you back. I'll tell you what I think. I'll try to help you. You know, now I'm not going to personally involve in anyone's life, but if you say, well, I'm thinking about this or that, I'll tell you what, you know, you might want to take a business course or two in school. You know, that's the, that's the drawback of just going to art schools. You don't take any business courses. And you hear how artists get taken advantage of? Well, not so much if you take some business courses. So I will give you, you know, certain things to think about. Um, but it's my pleasure to be able to to give that back because I I, I, I value it so much when I finally did get some mentors. Last question. What's next? What is next? Well, I do have some more books coming out. I figured you would. <laughs> <laughs> they are a series, you know. That's what I hear. It's a series. That's true. <laughs> um, and uh, it's I have one coming out uh, at, called the, uh, the Creative Girls Draw Fashion Design Studio. And it's the first book I've done on uh, fashion design. And it's for it's to bring the how to draw element to people who want to draw up fashion and the outfits and the clothing, know how the folds work in clothes, because people really need to know how to make those things look real, the flounces, et cetera. But there are books of fashion, but they don't really show you how to draw the figure. They, it's very preliminary stuff. Well, unless you draw the figure well, the clothes don't hang well. So this is it's sort of an interesting way to learn figure drawing because it has lots of style blended with it right away, um, and that's coming out in November. Oh, very good. All right. Well, uh, folks, listen. You can find manga for the beginner, Midnight Monsters, as well as the previous book that drew Chris to the show, Humongous Book of Cartooning, and many, many, many other how-to cartooning <laughs> books written and illustrated by my guest. You see him right there. You can hear him, uh, Christopher Hart, Chris Hart. Uh, they're in great stores. Great stores everywhere, including the Tate Modern Museum Bookshop. Uh, um, or you can or, you can order them right now at a great price at MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. As a matter of fact, if you're watching the video, if you look just below the video on the screen, you'll see the cover to Midnight Monsters. Click on that. You can buy it right then. If you want to buy some others, it'll take you to more Chris Hart books. Uh, knock yourself out. Uh, <laughs> support us. Uh, support your friend, Mr. Media. Uh, Chris, your website, I believe, is chrishartbooks.com? That's it, yes. Okay. And are you on Twitter, Facebook, any of that kind of stuff? A Facebook, and I also have a YouTube channel, which has uh, you know close to 100 How to Draw videos on it. And they're all like two or three minutes, so you see it happening very fast. It, you know, And you see it happening all from scratch rather than some finished stuff. Like the thing I showed you today was finished, mm -hmm. except for one thing I want to show you. That stuff is all... We all do it together right from the beginning. So if you just keyword Chris Hart draws and cartoons almost anywhere, you'll see something will come up good. All right. We'll have all the links uh, to YouTube and Facebook oh, and you. uh, your website. It'll all be on the page. So people, it'll be very easy. Just look down, folks. It's right there. Uh, Chris Hart, always a pleasure. Uh, too, very much. Delighted to see uh, your work in London. Delighted to see you here. Uh, I believe in Connecticut. Is that where you're at? That's where I am. I'm in Connecticut, the Nutmeg State. Very good. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks so much for joining us today on Mr. Media. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It's always you're a great interviewer and also to talk to uh, the readers out there. Uh, thank you very much. Our pleasure. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love from Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. 
It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The TechCrunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com. And tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening. This is Rick Kirkman, co-creator of the syndicated comic strip Baby Blues, and you're watching Mr. Media. Hi, I'm Jonathan Hood, creator of Bleak of the Rechargeable Dog, and you are watching Mr. Media.